Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to cover one of the sub-archetypes of superheroes in the American monomyth. If you're new to this series of videos, I have placed all of these together in a list. They begin with the basic terminology of the hero's journey in the American monomyth. We move on to the two basic distinctions between superheroes, aspirational and cathartic motivational. And I have a few subcategories in there already. This is a new entry. If all of this is brand new to you, this is my area of scholarship. The study of heroes in our popular mythology and their effects on culture and the classifications of them. This first archetype is one that I've spoken about before when I've talked about Spider-Man here and there, but it really is the best one to start with because I find it's the one people are the most familiar with, usually. And this is the archetype of the trickster. Now our goal here is to move into the trickster as he manifests in the American superhero figure. And that's where we will end up. But first, a little bit of background information on the trickster archetype in general. Mythologies across the world, across different time periods, commonly contain some sort of trickster figure. Sometimes this is a god, one of the gods that they revere. Sometimes it's even a creator god, like in many of the Native American tribes. Sometimes it's an enemy of the gods. More often than not, though, it is a god who can sometimes be a blessing and sometimes be a curse. The one example from mythology that everybody seems to know something about is Loki. Of course, we see this manifested in Loki in the Marvel Universe, but even just the character of Loki from actual Norse mythology. This was a, a god in the Pantheon, in Asgard, there with Thor, with Odin, and all of the other gods and goddesses, and he was one that people would pay homage to. But he was recognized as being both a blessing and a curse. In Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology, he recounts the tale of how it was really due to Loki that the gods gained their greatest treasures, including Thor's hammer. And he says, that was the thing about Loki. You resented him even when you were the most grateful. And you were grateful even when you hated him the most. And that really is the nature of a trickster. That's why they're so popular. So Loki, Hermes in Greek mythology, certainly. Anansi from African mythology. And Coyote, Raven, its various incarnations in Native American mythology. Culturally, the effect of the trickster in ancient mythologies was to blur boundaries. And this is important on several levels. Of course, just in the story, a trickster blurs the boundaries between right and wrong, between what is wise and what is foolish. You'll often find certain tricksters cross-dressing, blurring the boundaries of gender. They will blur the boundaries of what is natural, what is unnatural, between man and God even. Psychologically, what this does for culture is it helps them expand without losing cultural identity. It helps to think of culture like purebred dogs. If you know anything about purebred dogs, they tend not to be very healthy. They don't have as long of lifespans as a mutt because there's no new genetic information. They're continuously bred with other dogs of their breed and the genetic information becomes so weak at some point so they will often have joint issues and organ troubles and failures and whatnot they need new genetic information and dog breeders experiment with ways to do that sometimes without corrupting the breed too much and that's what a trickster does for a culture if you think of a culture like a dog breed cultures especially in ancient times when you had different tribes they can stagnate let's say that tribe a is incredibly good at hunting. They've developed all of these skills and all of these tactics, and they've developed tools for sharpening spears just so. And let's say that Tribe B, a certain ways away, is incredibly good at farming. They have really mastered a certain measure of agriculture very well. Well, if these two tribes continued to be exclusive and self-contained into their tribes, you would have, at the very least, malnutrition happening eventually, right? There'd be too much protein in tribe A and not enough in tribe B or that sort of thing. This is just a superficial example, but it gets the idea across. Somewhere in between those two cultures, there needs to be an exchange of ideas. The boundary needs to be blurred just a little bit. It can't be done away with because if those two cultures merge together, then there's no more tribe A and there's no more tribe B. Now you have a new thing, a tribe C. 
So if tribes, if your culture, if your heritage is to be maintained, you can't do away with the boundary, but it has to blur a little bit to let some new information in, to let some new knowledge, to let some new blood sometimes. Sometimes you do have to intermarry and stuff like that. So the trickster god in these mythologies helped people grasp that notion, encouraged people to do such things, to not hold so fast to their traditions, but to not forget their traditions either. That was important for cultural growth. So what about our culture today? Obviously, we're beyond segregated tribes. The American culture in particular is often described as the giant melting pot. And in a lot of ways, that's true. So what can the trickster do for us? Well, the trickster can still do the same thing, but on different levels. The trickster helps us every so often to question certain traditions, to question certain ways of doing things, just to make sure we either are certain about the utility and effectiveness of that and importance, or maybe it was something that worked for a previous generation and we'd like to do things differently now. Tricksters are everywhere in our modern day mythology. Bugs Bunny is a classic what people like to bring up, constantly dressing as a woman to get by on other characters. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? He's really in between. He's not exactly altruistic, but he's not mean-spirited and evil either. Peter Pan is another trickster, blurring the boundary between childhood and adult. Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow is a wonderful trickster because he blurs the boundary between what is masculine and what is feminine. He's a male adventure hero who walks around with limp wrists, eyeshadow, and so forth. He blurs the boundary between what is insane and wise and cunning because he acts insane, but oftentimes you see him orchestrating these elaborate schemes of escape. The trickster can also help with people who feel they are the underdogs. In fact, Bugs Bunny's predecessor was Br'er Rabbit. Joel Chandler Harris weaved this character of Br'er Rabbit from the stories he heard from slaves growing up. Harris was the author of the Uncle Remus tales that went on to inspire Disney's Song of the South, the whole zippity doo dah zippity a And these tales were an amalgamation of African tales brought over by many of the slaves and many of the Native American tales of the trickster, sometimes embodied as a rabbit. And if you read a lot of those tales, you have the appeal of Br'er Rabbit, who is an underdog, who is not a powerful being. He is physically at the mercy of Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox. They are the predators of the rabbit, and yet he outsmarts them. He outwits them and is able to achieve his own goals, even under their quote-unquote power. It's not hard to see how stories like that would be encouraging and appealing to people who are literally enslaved. Even after slavery, though, oppression certainly didn't go away to different types of peoples, whether by race, sex, gender, station in life, a whole variety of individual scenarios. That's why tricksters still survive and are still so popular. They have a special appeal to anyone who feels they're disenfranchised to some degree. So how do all of those aspects show forth in the superhero trickster? Spider-Man is perhaps one of the greatest examples of the superhero trickster. This is a boy when he gets his powers. He's a teenage boy, but he calls himself Spider-Man. He's blurring the boundary between what is childish and what is an adult. And that's his story, right? He blurs the boundary between a childlike fun and a childlike sense of wonder at having these powers and yet an adult-like sense of responsibility that he knows he has to live up to. He blurs that boundary. You will often see trickster archetypes named for animals because there's a blurred boundary of what is human and what is animal. So we have Spider-Man, Beast Boy, another classic trickster, literally a shapeshifter. He's going to blur the boundaries of what is human, what is animal. And his personality is very lighthearted, very tricksterish. Robin, Dick Grayson, when he first became Robin, even though he took the name Robin in a lot of tellings from the character of Robin Hood, he's still seen as the bird boy, quote unquote. And his acrobatics make him very Robin-like as he flits to from here to there. He blurs the boundaries of what should be humanly possible. Speedsters are quite often, not always, but quite often tricksters. This is certainly the case with many renditions of Quicksilver, the Wally West Flash, Impulse, and each of them will blur boundaries. They'll blur boundaries, like I said, with Spider-Man between what is childlike and what is adult, what is masculine and what is feminine. Spider-Man does that quite well because of his spider-like powers and agility. He'll often pose in certain ways 
which you wouldn't necessarily call masculine. I have this one panel here from The Ultimate Spider-Man by Bendis, and this is young Peter Parker developing the web fluid that he's going to use for his web shooters. And here we have this scene of a young Peter Parker, teenage boy, in his basement. They've chosen to depict him in his tidy whities and he's jumping around. If I were to tell you, before you saw this picture, that I was about to show you an image of a teenage boy in his basement, in his underwear, shooting a sticky substance against the wall, you would have anticipated an entirely different image than Spider-Man creating his web fluid. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that any of the creators and artists here or whatever are trying to say that Spider-Man's really masturbating in his basement. Of course not. But whether consciously or unconsciously, they chose this imagery because it represents that in-between space of puberty, of boy to man. And this is a place that the character of Spider-Man embodies so easily. So the trickster is a common sub-archetype in the superhero universe, certainly within our culture in general. With any of these topics, I could speak for hours on them as I do in my courses. But for the YouTube videos, we will keep this short. In the comments, though, I'd love to hear who are some of your favorite tricksters in comic books. Specifically heroes. We can certainly point to a lot of tricksters as villains. The tricksters work rather well as villains because they are constantly questioning. They are constantly trying to blur the boundaries between laws, right? So that's, that's an easy fit for a trickster archetype. But the trickster villain certainly carries things far beyond what a trickster hero would. So let me know some of your favorite trickster heroes. And stay tuned, eventually we will get to another one of these videos. I believe I'll cover the Frontiersmen next. Until then, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.